In this section, Paul addresses our attention to the tabernacle given to the Hebrew people in the desert, wastelands, between the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan. He then compares that earthly tabernacle with the true tabernacle that's in heaven. The heavenly tabernacle now open to us as people of God. In the past, Israel's tabernacle in the wilderness, although ordained by God, was really rather basic, illustrative, temporary, and suited only for those who were still in somewhat of a spiritual infancy. It is noteworthy that he used the illustration of the tabernacle rather than the temple. Um, I'd like to just kind of share what, what uh, John Phillips, the, the commentary John Phillips has on his uh, study exploring Hebrews. And he says um, on, on uh, page 97, we might wonder why he chose the tabernacle rather than the temple. That's pretty good. The tabernacle was God's provision for his people during the wilderness journey from <coughs> Egypt to the Promised Land. The temple... I, I've been processing this all week, and I'll, I'll give it to you so that you can process it. Huh. John Philip says, the temple was David's idea. Huh. And although accepted by God, seems to have been somewhat of an innovation. The types of the tabernacle are suited to us as pilgrim people redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and making our way home through the hostile environment of this world, the types of the temple are more suited to the nation of Israel and the millennial reign of Christ. Hmm. Do you see what he's sharing? Is that the tabernacle speaks to you and I. We're traveling through the wilderness right now. Amen? Oh, when this day of travel is over and we're there in the promised land. Amen? Amen? Looking forward to that. But the temple, how does that apply to you and I? <laughs> I have to agree with him. It seems to apply more to the people of Israel. And so, when God calls together the people of Israel after the tribulation, and start of the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ in the city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem. it applies more to the people of Israel than it does to us. Do you, do you see his argument? I have to, I scratch my head and think on it and say, I have to agree a little bit with where he's going, or at least his spirit. The temple does direct our attention to the coming millennial kingdom. It does uh, give our attention on God's plan for the nation of Israel. The tabernacle, on the other hand, which was a temporary dwelling place, pictured the truth for a pilgrim people. It has an application to the present times, when the Holy Spirit is leading the new disp dispensation company through the wilderness of this sinful world, on to the rest that remains for the people of God. As the first covenant, the New Test, the Old Testament, the first covenant was only for a period of time, so was the first tabernacle. Oh yes, it had ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuary. Verse 1 in chapter 9, right? It had that divine service and worldly sacrifice, that word worldly um, upsets um, some of us now because we use the word worldly kind of as a, as a symbol for evil or for selfishness or something on that order. But the word that is, is here is, um, have I got letting Greek scholars in this room? I'm not sure. 
I think I think I'll just use English then, isn't it? Um, Cosmicon is the word that is used in this in this verse. Cosmicon. Cosmic, I see. How about you? Yeah. You see the word cosmic there? Cosmic, yeah. And that's speaking of earthly. Nothing about wickedness. He made a cosmic mistake. That isn't evil, right? That's just a magnitude type. That's a big one. It, it involves a lot. It means, and this word cosmicon means this physical world. It's speaking of the world, not things that are wicked. It's just talking about the, the uh, terra firma of, of this world. As in contrast with the other word, and that would be heaven, right? We're in this world, cosmicon. We're in this area right here but soon we'll be transitioning to there, to a heavenly realm. Um, the word worldly does not have any evil connotation in, in this text. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, our King James people, who worldly did not have the same connotation as it has for you and I, put that in there. Um, a better translation of that would be earthly. Okay? Because it's speaking of the yeah. physical world. Earthly, yeah. rather. So you can read that verse, verse 1, with that in mind. You can read, When verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and of earthly sanctuary. All of a sudden, the sanctuary he's talking about in verse 1 is speaking about a physical sanctuary. One you can go knock on the door. It's a physical sanctuary rather than the heavenly, as opposed to the heavenly sanctuary um, of which our Father is. So, we look at this. The shadow of the earthly priesthood um, as he gives it to us in verse 1. Hebrews reminds the readers that the regulations and the practices in the tabernacle were ordained of God. If there was any inferiority in the tabernacle service, it was not, I repeat, not because God had not established the ritual. God set up the, the tabernacle in the wilderness. He commanded Moses to build this structure and to worship the living God in that structure. He gave laws and rules in regards to who might enter that place and how far they might go when they enter that place. But there was no inferiority of what he had set up. No. While the, New Te the Old Testament was in force, the ministry of the priests was obtained of God perfect and proper. We ended our study last week, remember, with the statement of chapter 8 and verse 13. Glance over there. Chapter 8, verse 13. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made, the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Let me say that again so that you understand. Because he's using the term new covenant, he is implying that the old covenant is to be done away with. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? Yeah. Let me read that verse once again and, and keep, it, keep that in mind. In that he said, new covenant, he hath made the first old now that which decayeth, that which waxeth old, is ready to vanish away. Okay? That's where we ended last week. 
Um, what was it then that had made the old covenant inferior? There are five answers to that question as we study the tabernacle together. One, two, three. Uh -huh. I see where Craig's going in this. Uh -huh. The first, it was an earthly sanctuary. Verse one. Yeah. Then verily, the first covenant had ordinances of divine service, worship services, and worldly or earthly sanctuary. What made the old covenant inferior? It had an earthly sanctuary. It had a sanctuary that can get old, dirty, torn. Things can go wrong with it. Why? Because it's physical and that's what happens to the physical. It means that the tabernacle was made by the hands of men. It says in Verse 11, I believe. Well, you can glance over there. It was made by the hands of men, says verse 11. It was pitched by man. Remember, it's a tent. It was pitched by man. Chapter 8, verse 2 declares that. The Hebrew people generously brought their gifts to Moses. And from those earthly materials, the tabernacle was constructed. Then God gave wisdom and he gave skill to a man by the name of Bezalel and Oholiah to do the intricate work of making the various parts of the tabernacle and its furnishing as carefully recorded in Exodus chapter 35 and chapter 36. After the construction was completed, the sanctuary was raised up in place um, and it was dedicated to God in Exodus chapter 40. Even though the glory of God inhabited the place, it was still an earthly structure constructed by men with earthly materials. Being an earthly structure, it was limited geographically. What do you mean? It was pitched in one place. And when they set it up here, it wasn't over there. You had to come to this place. Geographically, it could only occupy one place. That's a part of being an earthly structure. Um, it had to be dismantled. The various parts wrapped up and physically carried from place to place. Furthermore, it belonged to the people of Israel, not to the world. Ooh. The tabernacle was for the people of Israel, not Egypt, not Jordan, not Babylon. Sorry, guys, not you. The tabernacle was put up for what nation? Israel. Israel. It was this covenant. So, um, what made the old covenant inferior? Well, it was made of earthly things. And second, it was inferior because it was a type, not the actual thing, but a type of something that was far greater. Look at verse 2. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, right? The stones of the Ten Commandments, verse 5. And over it, the cherubim, the angels, um, pitch, uh, representatives of angels of glory, shadowing the mercy seat 
of which we cannot now speak particularly. <coughs> the word tabernacle is simply the Greek word for tent. Okay, I know we have a word tent. We go camping in those suckers, right? Go out with the kids, go camping, enjoy the, enjoy the weather and, and, uh, and all the things that the, the desert provides for us. But there's a tabernacle. Any of you own a tabernacle? Oh, tabernacle. That's got a lot of letters to it, so it must be really important. And one would think that there would be a special word in the Hebrew language for tabernacle. Yeah. It's a simple Hebrew word for tent. Mm. Well, when we get to the New Testament, surely they would come up with something really special. But they just used the Greek word, the skia, which is a temporary structure made out of cloth. Uh, sorry, there's no special word except in English. We really make it special, don't we? We grab the word tabernacle. Where did we get that? Who knows? Who cares? We're using it. And that stands for what God had brought to the nation of Israel, right? Not a tent, but a tabernacle. And then when us Baptists go to a new town and such, we'll, we'll build a temporary structure, or we used to back in the, in the olden days, we build it new structure, a kind of flimsy little structure, and that could meet with a lot of people, and we get a church started in that, and then we would build a church house, and the tabernacle would be used by the youth group, or else it was used for evangelistic meetings, or we just sell, sold the wood and got rid of it, right? Tabernacle stood for a temporary sanctuary in our language. Now, those of you with another language, I'm sorry. I don't know exactly what, what your translations look like, and I didn't uh, take the time to look it up. But in English, understand, when you see the word tabernacle, taber is simply our English word for an encampment. Taber. And you'll see that on the names of a lot of different places, something tab, taber and something, something like that. And that's just simply a fancy word for, for tent. The phrases, the first, used in verse two, and then the second, used in <laughs> verse seven, refer to the first and the second division of the tabernacle. This. Um, tent, beloved. Oh, don't be reset. But this tent had a structure somewhat like this. If you're looking at the floor, and a square, a perfect square. In fact, when you look at the ceiling in such a perfect cube, when you entered it, was the holy of holies. In the holy of holies was one piece of furniture, and that was the Ark of the Covenant, okay? The Ark, Ark once again, is a fancy word for a box. It's the box of the Covenant. Um, and the other languages don't seem to jump in and, and pick up a fancy word like us. Ark, isn't that a cool word? The Ark of the Covenant, this box that contained um, he, he shares it here, um, some twigs that had blossomed. It was, a, it was the staff of Aaron and it bloomed uh, by, by uh, answer to prayer. And, and also the, the tablets that Moses took up uh, to the mount, the second set of them, he busted up the first ones, right? Moses broke all Ten Commandments in one fall. But he got those, the new ones made and they put it in the Ark of the Covenant. Now also in here, on this side, is the lampstand. 
And on this side was a simple table with bread. Twelve loaves of bread. A table. And in front of the doorway, you entered in this way, okay? In front of the doorway was a large structure that they would burn sacrifices on. It was the altar of sacrifice. And in front of it was a round bowl-like thing made out of brass. Both of these were made out of brass. And this held water, and it was called the labor. Okay, you go to a laboratory. When you go to a potty, you go to a laboratory. Why? Because afterwards, they expect you to wash your hands. A labor is something you wash in. It was a bowl that had water that they would wash uh, in. So, the first part was referred to as the holy place, and the second part was the holy of holies. The priests would work out here, and they would go inside here, but they were not permitted to go into this final room. Even the high priest was only allowed to go in one time in a year. Each of these divisions had its own special furnishings, and I just shared them with you. Each piece of the furniture had its own distinctive meaning. In the holy place, that first large room, stood the seven-branched uh, candlestick. Did I make seven? Yeah. Um, and that lamp and this um, structure here was referred to as a luchnia, luchnia, a soft H sound, luchnia, um, and that's what this X makes in the in the Greek language. And a luch was a light, and it's a particular light. It was an oil lamp. So actually, luchnia, in the Hebrew language, if you translate it into English, you would say, a lamp stand holding seven lamps. This was not a candelabra <laughs> in, in verse 2, the candlestick. That was King James, guys trying to sound very modern by using a more modern term. It was actually a lamp stand. And this lamp stand provided all the light necessary for the priests to minister in the holy place. That was that big, big room, the first room. Reminding also that the nation Israel was to be the light of the world. And Jesus Christ, the Bible says in John 8:12 was the light of the world. And he turns to us, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, and makes believers shine as the light of the world. There was also a table in that holy place with 12 loaves of bread on it, one for each tribe. It was called the table of showbread. Showbread actually is, that's all of us just jumping on board with what Martin Luther did in his translation. He came to the Hebrew word there and looked at it and went, ah, how do you translate that? So he went, Shubrot. And all of us say, whoa, that's pretty cool. Show bread. And, and we, we go with it. Um, the Bible itself refers to the table as the table of pres uh, uh, presentation, table of presence, the bread of presence. Only the priests could eat that bread. They were required each week to go in and take all the bread off of that table, put brand fresh bread on that table, and then stand right there and eat all of that bread, the old bread, gone. They weren't to leave a crumb, and then they could leave the room. When he describes that first room in verse 2, he makes no mention of the golden altar of incense. <coughs> Had Paul forgotten 
This altar stood immediately before the veil. See that verse 2. There was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was, here you go, candlestick and the table of showbread. Whoa! When I made my illustration up here, there was a, there's an extra... I was going to leave that up there and add that at that point was the incense altar which was placed right in front of the veil to go into the Holy of Holies. He never mentions it. Did he forget about it? No. Or is there some divine reason for neglecting to mention it? It all comes very clear when you carefully read the next three verses. Look at this, verse 4. Uh, verse 3, that is. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein the gold pot that had the manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables uh, of, the te of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, and over the cherubim, which was on top of it, the glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot speak particularly uh, any longer. What? What happened here? Notice the change from the expression wherein it said, um, verse 2, for there was a tabernacle made the first wherein was the candlestick, etc. And notice it switches to the word had. Dr. Alford explained that the Greek word translated had, echo, which means to have for a particular task. Can't mean just simply to contain something, because that censer, I'll say it carefully, that golden censer mentioned in this passage did not stay in the tabernacle. It did not stay in the Holy of Holies. When he says golden censer, he's not talking about the altar of incense. He doesn't mention the altar of incense. And you're going to see why in just a, a few moments. He says censer, not altar. A censer is like a bowl. And most of the bowls, well, nearly all of them, in the, in the tabernacle were made of brass. And they were used for the purpose of prayers. But there was one referred to here, and doesn't seem to be referred to hardly anywhere else, is a golden censer. A censer that carries incense burning, but it was, the, in, the instrument was made out of gold, pure gold. Um, Alfred quotes from the Mishnah to the effect that there was a special end censer used on the Day of Atonement. It was unique from all the others that were used, different, because it was made of solid gold. The golden censer mentioned by Paul in this verse, which was filled with burning <coughs> coals from the bronze altar of sacrifice outside the temple, was carried past the altar of incense through the veil of the Holy of Holies by the high priest on that day alone. I wish I would not have gotten rid of this uh, illustration. I was going to leave it up. Um, you understand, they would take that gold censer, the high priest alone, and he would come out to the altar, and he would get hot coals from that altar, and then he would walk through the holies, past the ark of incense, the altar of incense, through the veil, into the Holy of Holies, and then put sweet incense. And he would burn that incense to fill the room with a cloud of incense. <coughs> Wait a minute. What's the purpose? Well, understand the brass censers that we would have prayer, that we'd have things and, and incense and, and prayers being offered. He's talking about man's prayers. This golden censer which took its, its fire from the altar. And when you think of that altar, I 
think about losing a pin. Ah. <laughs> but when you think of that altar, think of the cross of Jesus Christ. Or it was symbolic of Christ's death. He takes from that, walks right past the regular prayers, into the Holy of Holies, and before the mercy seat, covers the mercy seat with this smoke, and then pulls out and sprinkles the blood. The prayers of the normal people, of you and I, the prayers of the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, His prayers on our behalf in the Holy of Holies where we cannot go. He makes prayer as He gives sacrifice. The picture is eternal. It's powerful. And it's so missed by many of the commentaries that I have on my shelf back home. Because I didn't stop and read that as a censor. And it doesn't use the word altar. It uses the word censor, the golden censor, um, which was used only one day out of the whole year. The perfect picture of the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Do you remember that prayer? The one on the altar that comes into the Holy of Holies? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That prayer, I believe, is what's symbolic in this golden censer going right into the Holy of Holies. The meaning of the writer, therefore, would be that the golden censer had to do with the drops of blood upon the mercy seat. <coughs> but it never remained a per permanent object in the Holy of Holies. Whether so if the high priest carried that golden censer into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, yes. and only went there once each year, Yes. Was the Day of Atonement that the high priest always went there? Yes. Why only once? When we have all these prayers going every single day in brass censers, right? And we've got the altar of incense is burning 24-7, right? There was only one prayer from the cross. Father, forgive me. And if, what if he would not have prayed for us? What if he would not have died upon Calvary's cross? We'd be doomed. Taken into the Holy of Holies is that prayer. Father, forgive them. The Holy of Holies contained the Ark, Ark of the Covenant, a wooden chest. It was three feet and nine inches long. It was two feet, three inches wide. It was two feet three inches high. On the top of this chest was a beautiful mercy a seat made of solid gold with the image of a cherub on each end, an angel at each end. A cherub actually is an angel of judgment on both sides. This was the throne of God in the tabernacle. On the Day of Atonement, the blood was sprinkled on this mercy seat to cover the tables of the law within the ark. As God looked down, he had to look through the blood to see the Ten Commandments. It was the mercy seat. That word mercy seat, by the way, is simply using a word that's translated elsewhere differently, and that is the word propitiation, satisfaction. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it's translated propitiation, satisfaction for our sins. Romans chapter 3, verse 25, once again, the propitiation is the exact same word that's being used here, referencing that mercy seat. But the blood of Jesus Christ does not cover sin. The blood of the goats, the blood of the ox, that was to cover the sin. But Jesus' blood does not cover the sin. It takes the sin away. There you go. Never to be remembered anymore. 
God. Yeah. When you say, oh Lord, Lord, you. when you get to get to glory, oh Lord, how could you bring me in here because of my sin? He'd say, what sin? What sin? <laughs> uh, Calvary's blood did not cover your sin. It took it away. No way. No way. Amen. Oh, don't let Satan oh, beat you up anymore. Because that's the easiest thing for him to scout. Yeah, when you get to glory, God's going to say, ah, I'm just kidding. You had too much sin. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, Ken Ross, a guy like me, I didn't get saved until I was 41. And prior to that, man, I was, I was a wretch. I was wicked. I was a bartender. I was just in the world. And what a transformation, man. I was born again, a new creature in Christ. I mean, it's just amazing what God is I thank Him every day. That sin yeah. went to Calvary's cross. Amen. And Jesus' blood, blood took it away. away. Don't doubt. No doubt. Many spiritual truths are wrapped up in these pieces of furniture. But the most important truth is this. All of this was symbolic. Symbolism. Not a spiritual reality. They were a... If you can come up with a better word, not a priest. All I could think of was shadow. shadow. It was a shadow of the reality, the spiritual reality. It was this fact that made the tabernacle of the old covenant inferior. And then, the reason it was inferior is because it was uh, inaccessible to the people. Look at verse 6. Oh my goodness. In verse 6 he says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went away into the first tabernacle. Who did? The priests did. Accomplishing the service of God. Who served God? The priests. But into the second went the high priest. Who? The high priest. Alone. Once every year. Not without blood. Which he offered for himself. That was what the bullock was for. And for the errors. Agnoma is the word there. The unknown sins, numberless sins of you and I. He offered, uh, the high priest offered for the unknown sins, the numberless sins of the people. You must get the idea that the Hebrews assembled at the tabernacle for worship. You know, in a, in a similar manner that we gathered to the church house on Sunday morning. The priests and the Levites were permitted into the interior of that tent, the tabernacle. But none, got it, none of the other people from different tribes could attend. They couldn't come and watch the services. They couldn't come and video them and show them to their kids. Mm. You understand? They couldn't go in there. Yeah. unless they were of the tribe of Levi with a purpose. Furthermore, although the priests ministered in the holy place day after day, only one man, the high priest, entered the Holy of Holies, and that only once a year, and that only on one particular day, the Day of Atonement. When he did, he had to offer sacrifice for his own sin as well as for the sins of the people. In contrast, the heavenly tabernacle is open to all the people of God for all times. So what makes the old covenant inferior? Look at it. It was temporary. Verse 8. Verse 8. It was temporary. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest or noticed while as the first tabernacle was not yet standing. The fact that the outer court, that first tabernacle, um, verse 6, was standing was proof that God's work of salvation for man had not yet been completed. That outer court stood between the people and the Holy of Holies. As long as the priests were ministering in the holy place, the way had not been opened to the presence of God. But when Jesus died on the cross, 
what happened. Recorded in Matthew 27, verses 50 and 51. The veil, was the veil that stood between the holy place and the holy of holies tore. It was open. Right. It was for all to walk in. Not just a high priest, but for all. And that way, being open, there was no longer any need for a holy place or a holy of her holies. No. The sanctuary at that point became immaterial, unusable, irrelevant. For the real sacrifice was made over yonder on Calvary's Amen. hill. Amen. There was no longer any more need for either a holy place or a holy of holies for now believing sinners would come into the very presence of the living God. Amen. And he says, your sins have been forgiven. Amen. So what makes the old covenant inferior? Its ministry was external, not internal. Look at verse 9 and we'll be closing with these. Which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. The thought of the writer that is that the Levitical system found its operating basis in meats and drinks and diverse washings. The word meats uh, in the Greek language is the word broma. Broma. And the word broma means food. Ah. Understand in 1611, another word for just saying food, you would say meat. Come, my wife will prepare meat for us. Food for us. The word meat meant food in 1611. It doesn't mean food today. It's a little more specific in these days. Uh, today, the word is confined almost entirely to the meaning of edible animal flesh. In regards to drinks, the Levitical law laid down no prohibitions except as to the absence in the case of the Nazarite vow. And of the priest, they were to officiate. Uh, Dr. Alfred again says that the writer had in mind both the legal and the Talmudic conditions imposed upon the worshipers. The writer describes these as, my version, carnal ordinances. The word carnal is sarks. We've had that word before. Um, yeah. we've, we've, we've hit that before. And that um, simply refers to humanity. The ordinances were such as had to do um, with the human condition of life. Uh, the need of food, the need of drink, cleanliness, these were imposed upon Israel until the time of Reformation, he said. The Greek word trans translated impose doesn't carry with it necessarily the idea our English word does of imposition, something laid upon somebody and it's an unwelcome burden. That's, don't get that. But just simply understand, it's um, epikema, which just means to set on one's shoulders. It's a light thing. You take that, he hands you a pen, and you put it in, in your pocket, that would be epikema. Okay, you're burying that, that pen. No, nothing, um, no imposition. It's just merely the laying upon. The word translated reformation is interesting, as well as important. It's the orthosis, orthosis, orthodontic, straightens teeth. Um, an ortho, all these ortho just means 
taking something that's crooked and putting it back straight. And that's the word that's used here uh, in this passage, which stood only in means of drinks, washings, carnal ordinances imposed on them till the time of setting things in order. King James uses reformation. I guess that's okay. We just don't use that word that way very much anymore, do we? Re, do it again, form. It was in order at one time, but no, it's a little out of order, so let's reform it. And that's how the King James has come up with, with this from the word that gives us a word like orthodontist, okay? Uh, putting it back in straight. The word means, in its physical sense, the making straight, the restoring to its natural and its rightful condition. Something which in some way now protrudes, it's got out of line, for instance, a broken arm, a broken leg, put back, mended, put back in its order. It means simply to set it straight. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, the Septuagint used it for mending one's ways. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 3, we won't, we won't go there, but Jeremiah 7, verses 3, and also in verse 5, it uses that same word, setting it in straight. The setting or establishing it. The word in this context here means to bring matters into a correct relationship with one another. It refers to the introduction of the New Testament, which later displaces that Old Testament. The Old Testament was never satisfactory, so far as it offering of sacrifice could pay for the sin was concerned. It couldn't actually by itself save a single believer. It always looked forward to Calvary's cross. The sacrifices offered on the tabernacle and the blood applied to the mercy seat could never change the heart, never change the conscience of a single worshiper. All the ceremonies associated with the tabernacle had to do with ceremonial purity, not moral purity. They were carnal ordinances that pertain to the outer man that couldn't change at all the inner soul. Father, thank you so much for your love, for your kindness to us and allowing us to study these words. Thank you for Paul to write these things down to reveal to us so that we might look once again at that tabernacle sanctuary and to see your part in each, each structure of that calling us to a saving knowledge in your son Jesus Christ you sent him to die upon Calvary's cross to pay in full for our sin thank you Father for that fill us as we go from this place I just pray that others would see Jesus in us Amen. that Father Amen. we'd be able to witness to them about the joy that is ours in knowing your son Jesus for it's in his precious name we pray Amen, Amen. Amen.